Hi, this is Jerry from SharePoint. This episode is part of a series where we check in with past guests to see how they're dealing with the COVID-19 situation. Because we're doing this remotely, there may be some technical glitches as we go along. We hope you're well with us as we're committed to bringing new content for as long as we can. Once it's safe to get back out, we'll return to our regular format. Until then, thanks for tuning in and enjoy the show. Welcome to SharePoint where we tap into the craft beer scene. I'm Jerry Hollow, your host. I'm talking with Ben Hunter from Denison's Brewing. Thanks for returning to the show, Ben. Thanks for having me. Uh, we originally had you on this past December uh, under notably better circumstances. Uh, so, <laughs> so let's talk about what you're dealing with now. Um, how has COVID-19 affected your business? Um, yeah, so... You know, obviously it's been tough times, but, uh, you know, we're, we've been really pleased by the amount of people that have wanted to support local and we've had a lot of repeat customers. So I definitely want to give a shout out to all of our um, awesome supporters and beer drinkers. And, um, so, so yeah, essentially it's, as soon as things were announced, um, you know, I think, uh, the owners of Denison did a really good job of jumping right on it. We started doing a beer mobile delivering beer mobile kind of delivering service thing. And, um, it's a fun fact that when Denison's opened their doors about six years ago, part of the original business plan was to do growler sales door to door. Um, so we kind of always had that idea in the back of our head and, you know, had the proper licensing and everything. So kind of jumped on the opportunity as soon as it happened. Um, you know, we started off with just our beers, but we slowly added on um, wine, um, cocktails, uh, um, cider and, and or mead from like charm city or ancho cidery um so trying to do some of our kind of you know regular things we have but also support some other local businesses and have some different mediums of alcohol so we've been doing um, the delivery seven days a week and you can you know visit our website innocencebrewingco.com and find a tab at the top that kind of cues you in to do all that um it's really contactless gives you an opportunity to kind of pay up front and as long as you can have an ID somewhere visible for us, then we don't really have to make an exchange. I can just kind of see it through the window or um, something like that and then I can drop it on the porch and go. Okay, that sounds great. Um, and like I noticed, you, you guys kind of were the first ones that I really noticed that jumped on it. Um, you know, we're able to jump into doing, you know, delivery in the curbside and uh, so you guys really kind of got to the forefront of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about Julie. You know, Denison's co-founder, Julie Varadi, uh, she's been quite a vocal advocate for not only Denison's, but for all small businesses uh, ever since this started. Uh, so maybe just talk a little bit about her background with why she's so uniquely qualified to fill this role. And then maybe some things that you guys have benefited from there at Denison's, as well as anything else you've heard uh, people benefiting from her advocacy uh, at other small businesses. Yeah, well, you know, Julie's past, she worked for the Small Business Association, so um, she's super in tune with a lot of, you know, things that go on to help small businesses, um, packages, and also she's, you know, ran for lieutenant governor, has, you know, done some work in politics, and so kind of understands that, um, you know, people need to speak up, and people need to call the representatives, and people need to kind of, you kind of have to take action, so I think that, uh, you know, everyone at Denison's, but especially Julie being, you know, the most vocal has really been pushing for like getting people to, you know, try to help stop, you know, certain payments or try to offer aid. And, you know, I think that she's done a really good job of bringing up all, all, all kinds of different points that um, people need to think about. And, you know, every, 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 you know, when Governor Hogan was rolling out kind of new things every Monday, that she would have a lot of things to say that, like, this is great, but what happens when this happens? So I think it was a really good job of just one, getting everybody else to kind of like speak up and, 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 and reach out for what they needed and, and to try to catch some of the things that were just missing in the plans that uh, the government in our area was setting up for us. Um, so I, I think it's been awesome that she's been, you know, not only helping Denison survive, but really kind of helping be a voice for some of the other people in our local area. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, I think that's just very fitting with the craft beer industry where everybody looks after each other and takes care of each other. It's, it's not this kind of cutthroat business that other people think of when they think of the real business world. They're like, well, why would you do something to help out your competitors? And, uh, you know, we talked back in, in December that that's just not how it is. 
craft beer, people are trying to help each other out, whether it's, you know, I got a bag of grain, I got a couple of parts that I can help you fix this thing with, um, whatever it is. And Julie doing this is just a huge example of she's not just looking out for herself. She's not just looking out for breweries. She's looking out for all small businesses that understands, you know, how important it is to, like you said, ask the right questions or, or know what the procedures are for people that have no idea. Totally. Personally, I'm in the dark for a lot of that stuff. So, you know, I, I find myself learning uh, things all the time about how we can, you know, work with and interact with the government and how we can try to get um, aid to, to enrich our community and keep small businesses going. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I'm saying it kind of reminds me of the guys that uh, guys at True Respite who put together the Beer Me app and, uh, you know, for that's hoping so many people all across the country with the online ordering and everything else. And uh, I remember reading a couple articles and people were like, well, why would you do that? Why would you give that away for free to competitors and people? And they're like, it was the right thing to do. Said, yeah. You know, really? so, um, well, you touched on a little bit earlier. You guys are talking about doing delivery and things and you've got the beer mobile. Uh, so that's a little bit of a unique branding. Uh, talk about maybe how that has set you apart uh, or maybe put Denison's more in the public eye. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you, you touched on, we both kind of touched on the fact that one, we jumped into it pretty quickly. So I think that, you know, early on when that, when the shutdown first happened, uh, people were, you know, definitely stir crazy. And so when they knew that they could order from us, they were, there was a lot of uh, word of mouth going around. And I think that we kind of made it fun by, you know, playing off of like a beer mobile, but it's also mobile beer delivery. And yeah. uh, so some people were, were definitely really interested in that. And uh, even a couple of people were kind of like, you know, is the actual beer mobile going to be delivering to me today? And, you know, we had to kind of explain to people that, um, you know, it was more of a branding and stuff, but we've actually had a lot of fun with it. We actually just made these uh, stickers that you can now um um, buy as part uh, you know we have merch for sale on our website uh, that you can do delivery for as well so we have little beer mobile stickers i just put one on my car today so that should be kind of fun and exciting and we actually had a customer as a 3d printer um kind of reach out to us and say hey i'd be happy to kind of like make a physical copy of this so uh, i think hopefully maybe we'll be able to pick that up and do some fun posts with it but you know, i think it goes along with our branding and our ethos and everything it's you know we want to be creative we want to be approachable and we want to be able to kind of just mingle with the people and so i think everyone's really appreciate the fun we've had with it we and you know everyone's been super supportive and i'm personally doing a lot of the deliveries myself uh probably julie brody and i are the two most uh deliverable employees if you will and uh so people have been you know thanks so much and people have been really supportive and really happy when we get there with the beer that's awesome that's great so given what you guys are doing um again it's not ideal but uh do you think that what you guys are currently doing is going to be enough to sustain you guys until the quarantine gets lifted I mean, fortunately for us, with, with everything going on um, through some of the programs we've been able to sign up for to help with aid and just from great support from our community, um, you know, we're, we're hanging on and we're floating and, um, you know, it's, it's looking like we're just going to keep adapting to whatever we can do. You know, we're looking at other states now, seeing what they're doing as, as some of the laws are being, uh, or, you know, relaxed with the social distancing. Uh, so we still have no idea what exactly will happen with Maryland, but, um, you know, it looks like for now the innocence is hanging on and, um, you know, we still need your support. So please, you know, tell a friend, share on Facebook, please let everybody know. And, you know, we're doing cocktails, beer and wine, like I said, sizer, cider, meat. So there's, there's something for everybody on there. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, and we, again, we touched on it a little bit, but go ahead and remind people again, because uh, just like you said, it's beer, it's wine, it's cocktails, it's food, uh, it's merchandise, it's, uh, I'm imagining a tipping and gratuities and things they can do like that to help. All that's in there. So I'll share the uh, information on how people can help you. Yeah, yeah. Denison'sBrewingCo.com is our website. Um, most of our, I mean, our social media handles for other Instagram, Facebook stuff is at Denison's Brewing. So, you know, that's a great way for you to share. Um, and for you to visit our website just in general to order. Um, so please uh, give a shout out to all your friends and family. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, so uh, you recently started uh, a weekly online video series. It's uh, called Wish You Were Beer. Uh, it's both entertaining and informative. 
Uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, tell us about it. Tell us uh, how the idea came about, you know, just uh, a little bit more for people because it, it just got going. So we want to get people to jump on board and take advantage of it. No, that's great. I'm, I'm glad to, to, to see that you have uh, viewed some episodes and that you're doing as well. We've been getting some fun feedback. Um, you know, I think it just kind of came. Um, I, I got an email one day from Emily Bruno, one of our co-founders, co-owners, and uh, she just said, you know, I've been thinking about you know, we're because a lot of our, we have two tap rooms now, right? And we've always been a very community focused and, you know, most of the fun ways that people can interact with us and learn more about our brand is in our tap room. And since mm-hmm. we don't have that, we're trying to create a, some sort of like fun tap room experience or some sort of like virtual interaction experience with people. Um, so I just got an email one day and she was like, what do you think about this? You know, we're trying to utilize some of your skills as a certified Cicerone. You know, I, I obviously have done a lot of studying and, um, you know, have a, a rich passion and a rich history of just beer knowledge. So um, they said, hey, why don't we put this together? And so it kind of happened like within a week, you know, I uh, started preparing on like what kind of topics I wanted to talk about and, and, and where we could go and obviously getting feedback from our other owners and our brewers and stuff. And um, so, yeah, we just decided to hop on in and, you know, it's been very kind of like piece it together, but the alter ego um, is a company next door to us. That is our neighbors. They do production. They kind of reached out and were like, Hey, you know, we're, we'd be happy to help, you know, kind of showcase what you guys are doing right now. We have some extra like space and time. So we're able to use um, their studios. Um, Obviously they don't have anybody working there. So we're able to keep our distances and Mm -hmm. um, you know, while they're shooting us, they're doing their thing and we're able to have our little table. So we have great neighbors that have been able to make that happen for us and give us like really quality stream. And, you know, we just decided we wanted it to be, fun but not dense we wanted it to be kind of interactive so we're trying to ask people questions we're trying to get them to give us like questions and feedback and stuff like that and i've been trying to come up with food um recipes and pairings and then you know hopefully people can interact and post their their attempts or their uh fails or successes with uh with that um and so you know other than a little bit of uh, technical difficulties here and there, I think it's been going really well. And the first week we talked about loggers. So that episode is up. Um, there are two parts of the episode because we got kind of got cut off in the middle, but mm-hmm. uh, definitely make sure you catch the, the end of the second part. There's some, some fun. That's good. Really yeah, some, shen- some shenanigans there. <laughs> yeah, some shenanigans. And um, we had an IPA series and we had Jeff uh, Ramirez, our head brewer, come on and talk about recipe development. And, and you know, we dived into a little bit of the stories behind the beers and everything. We talk about English style brewing. We'll feature our lowest lord. We have um, one of our kind of packaging um, technicians slash like microbiologist, uh, Tim Father Gilly works for us and he does our kind of microbiology, our lab work and, and help secure our packaging and everything like that so we're gonna have him on the show so it's been kind of a fun way to bring guests on talk about our current things that we um you know we already package and sell and then um just have a little fun and it sounds like that next one's going to be a little more up your alley with the uh the english ales and things Totally. And especially, as you know, my, my love of food and uh, food and beer pairing, the English style, especially the Lowest Lord, our ESB just has a lot of great food pairing opportunities. So since we're only going to be talking about kind of one of our beers and one subject, if you will, I'm, I'm hoping to maybe do a few deep dives or um, kind of touch a little deeply into something since we'll have a little more time to cover, uh, you know, just, with just one beer. Yeah, like, like I said, that one I knew was coming up your wheelhouse, and the IPAs, as you know, is definitely up mine. And uh, guys, uh, talked about the animal, what I enjoyed way back in December, so uh, it was pretty exciting for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, do you guys have anything new that's coming up as far as new releases or things that you might be doing? Uh, you know, kind of tell us what's coming down the pipe. Yeah, well, I can tell you. Um, you know, it's somewhat new, new to 2020. Really, we um, decided we we're going to start bottling some of our more kind of specialty projects, usually things that are touching barrels and have um, wild yeast, uh, souring bacteria, or maybe it's just a bourbon barrel age type of style. So um, we have, we just released our Brett party, which is a fun version of our third party, Belgian triples, one of our year round core beers. Mm-hmm. Um, the triple is, you know, we're for five, 
almost six years now, we've been one of the few uh, breweries putting a triple into cans and making it a year-round beer. So for people that kind of like that stronger style, that's a little bit of a following. So this is a fun way to see a different side of that. So it's the base recipe, but we do put it into barrels. Most of these are neutral wine barrels, so we're not going to get much oak flavor, but we are going to get the interaction of the microbes inside the barrel. Um, so this is mostly a Britannum Icy beer. There is a, a subtle tartness to the beer, but I wouldn't necessarily kind of say it's a sour beer per se mm -hmm. um but a fun spin on that so look for just new bottles we have a sligo creek uh, which is kind of fun playing off of sligo creek parkway and sligo creek near us um and it's going to be kind of a cherry inspired belgian beer it has a little bit of a, a fun beer we did it um i guess it was a year and a half ago maybe two years ago woodside wit was a winter version of a wit beer it was a stronger 8.2 and we used cardamom so mm -hmm. there's some of that in there and a few other barrels that are blended in then we have some cherry puree um, coming in, I, I think also with that one, the tartness, the sourness is going to be more balanced and subdued. Um, so we have like new bottles that we're going to be releasing as we go on. And one of our Wish You Were Beer episodes is going to be about kind of our sour and barrel program. And we plan to have two bottles that you can buy that we can offer um, to have alongside that tasting. Another fun thing that we are going to have is a... Um, sour for the first time in cans kind of more of like the fruit style a more simple kettle sour our georgia avenue has been a beer that we've done for the past three or four years um it's around a four and a half percent kind of wheat beer base um obviously we sour that bring the tartness down and we add peach um puree to that to really get a nice character so obviously peaches being mainly from georgia and we're right up georgia avenue look for that to come out um we did just have, it's been, it's been out for a little bit, but our, we did a Pink Boots um, Society um, release. So we have four packs of that, a really nice um, kind of lower alcohol, like in the 5% pale ale, a little bit of hibiscus. It's not really overly hoppy. It's got a nice touch of hibiscus. It's just a perfect kind of spring, summer, really drinkable beer. Um, so I would say look for that. Um, we have uh, for growler fills, um, we had been planning on doing a beer for a restaurant. Well, with all this going on, um, obviously those plans are a little bit um, thrown off guard. So we're, we, we are going to be able to offer a new IPA around 5.8% to keep your eye out from a new IPA from um, coming from us soon. Um, the only downside is, is that we won't package that beer because we weren't planning to, but it will be available for growler fill. Uh, um, the name is Mercy Me kind of has a fun uh, DC play and um, kind of loops in with Marvin Gaye and stuff like that. So look for an IPA there. And then I know that we're starting to talk about maybe doing a four pack of a double IPA maybe in the summer. Um, so we definitely have some kind of fun stuff. And I know that they've also been rolling out um, new cocktails and, you know, we've added like a soft blanc. So now we have two white wines. So we're kind of always trying to add and figure out what we can do. And our offerings from like Charm City and stuff like that are changing from week to week. So um, definitely trying to keep fun and engaged and keep new beers rolling. That sounds great. And uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, we, we talked last time with uh, Keith at Wardaka and uh, also with Corey at Manor Hill. And they both kind of touched on, you know, if they can kind of keep some new beers coming out every so often, uh, it keeps the excitement level up and people are encouraged to kind of come back. And uh, like you guys, it's, it's contactless, it's, it's easy, it's easy pickup or in your case, even delivery. Uh, I think that's going to keep having repeat customers as well as new customers. And hopefully that uh, can help you guys get through until uh, things get a little better. <laughs> Definitely. And one thing I realized that I didn't really kind of mention was that we are doing food, but it's not through our beer mobile delivery. It's through Uber Eats. Okay. Um, so I believe the current schedule is uh, Wednesday through Sunday. You can order um, food from us. So, And we even have some slightly new food options. So please keep that in mind, too. Um, you know, like you said, all these orders and stuff are really helping keep us afloat. And we're really trying to get get to that point where we can have people come join us in the beer garden. You know, this year we spent a lot of money getting our beer garden like revamped and ready to go. And unfortunately we haven't really been able to use it much, but um, we've put full AstroTurf out in the entire beer garden. We've got lounge couches. We've really kind of like up the atmosphere. And so we're, we're just waiting and working to get to that point where we can have some people, some smiling faces back in our tap room. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, well, Ben, I want to thank you for your time. 
Uh, I hope that you and everyone at Denison stay healthy and busy. Uh, and then I look forward to a time in the near future when uh, you and I can share a pint again in person. That sounds great. I'd love to share a pint. I'm joined now by Mark Osborne from Majority Theory. Thanks for returning to the show, Mark. Hello. Thanks for having me back on. We originally had you on this past January under notably better circumstances. Uh, so uh, let's talk about what you're dealing with now. Uh, how has COVID-19 affected your business? Um, so, you know, Virginia was a little bit later than Maryland in terms of, you know, the, um, you know, the shutdown. So we operated right up until the 24th of March. Um, it was a little bit suppressed because we could only let a certain number of people in at a time. But, you know, it was mostly business as usual. Um, then we shut down the tasting room except for to go. And obviously that's, uh, you know, a, a big number of, you know, a reduction of sales. But it didn't go to zero. You know, I mean, it's down, I think, on average, like 55 percent ish you know it's it's been it's varied a little bit over the last couple of weeks but you know it's not i mean it's, you know obviously a, a reduction but it's not like a 90 percent reduction or something so um mm -hmm. i haven't laid anybody off i've kept um all of my people and you know i've moved them into different things at the brewery so some of the people that worked at the tasty room are now doing you know some things on the packaging side or on the distribution side of our business so you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's not great. Uh, I think people have had, you know, generally, you know, some hours reduced a little bit, but not, you know, it's been not been catastrophic mm -hmm. for us. And, and on the distribution side of the business, uh, it's actually, I think, increased over uh, the last six weeks and all signs look like it's going to continue to increase. So we're optimistic. Right. Uh, are there any other types of things that you've had to do to adapt your day-to-day -day operations? Um, I mean, on the tasting room side of things, the, um, the um you know the sanitary aspects of it i'm sure the same as everybody else on the distribution side of thing that's a bit of a scary job because you're going into multiple stores you know and interacting with multiple people so um you know that's been a little bit scary um but you know we so far so good haven't had any any of our staff you know um know anybody that's been sick or you know showed any symptoms and gotten tested I mean, obviously, they could all be sick. We just don't know it, but I guess that's a different issue. Um, well, you know, again, less than ideal, but the current situation of what you're doing and mostly distribution and mailing and things like that, uh, do you think what you're doing is going to be able to sustain you guys until uh, the quarantine is lifted? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, unequivocally. Um, you know, um, between adding more shipping than we used to do, because we've always done shipping, it's just become a bigger component of our business. Uh, distribution, both you know, in the DMV, but also we've, you know, we've began shipping beer to other areas and then we'd already been shipping beer internationally and that business has also picked up. So I think, um, I think we'll actually end up growing during this period versus shrinking. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we haven't run the numbers to see exactly where we're at, but, um, all signs appear to be pointing towards, Things are going very well, and I think, you know, we'll be ready, hopefully come out of it, whether it's summer or whatever, you know, position to continue expanding. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the mailing. Uh, you're the only brewery in this area that I'm aware of that's uh, shipping. So tell us how this happened and what allows you to ship your beer. Virginia is a very good state in terms of uh, being able to distribute. Um, we've always shipped to like Ohio and a couple other places. Um, so we tried to follow the model of like Tavor, which mm -hmm. is a place that we already sell beer, um, as well as copied what other places are doing like burial, for instance, they, you know, they, they were kind of ahead of the curve on that. Um, but we've always shipped our beer from like day one. Um, you know, it's just to be honest with you. Most people didn't want to pay the shipping. They'd rather just drive to the brewery because they also wanted to have a beer while they were at the brewery. Um, and not wanting to pay, you know, 10, 15 bucks just to have something shipped. But, um, you know, uh, UPS has relaxed their shipping laws. Well, I say relaxed, but like it's easier than it was at the beginning. I remember back in 2014, 2015, like we'd be like, we have a license to ship beer here in Virginia. And, and 
FedEx would be like, ooh, no, we can only ship wine, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, it's perfectly legal. You know, it says on your website, it's perfectly legal. But, you know, that's been less, less problematic than it used to be. Mm-hmm. Although the biggest problem is not so much the um, shipping aspect of it. It's the fact that the shippers are overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like they're overwhelmed. They don't say they're overwhelmed, but they, it's blatantly obvious you know, they're delivering these packages at nine o'clock at night to the wrong address. And then the person's, you know, not happy. And then some strange person that you didn't ship beer to is like, what is this? You shipped me something to my house. I'm like, so I'm learning a lot about the logistics of running a shipping business. I also have a newfound appreciation for, um, uh, people that work in like a mail order business Mm -hmm. because it is, there are definitely things that are challenging you would be shocked at how many people have no idea where they live. Oh. Um, you know, they literally put the wrong city, hmm. the wrong zip code, you know, they, they mutilate their street address and you're just like, dude, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they never ship oh, anything really to themselves. So. <laughs> out, right. You know and I'm like? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like dealing with the customers, you know, most people are like 98% of them are really cool. And like, you know, even if there's an error, you try to get it resolved and work it out. But then there's people that are just like, seriously, <laughs> <laughs> like, have you not ordered something before in the past? Is the first time you've ever ordered something on the computer? So um, what can people do to help? Tell people exactly how they can help you guys out. Well, I think, um, I mean, obviously, you know, Obviously, ordering from us has been very, very good, you know, from a cash flow perspective. Um, it also helps us plan out where to send beer, um, you know, because with us, um, every single beer that I can think of, you know, this year for sure and, and in the last year also has been not just sold out by the time it comes out, but like oversold. So we have to decide where it's going and who's getting what. And knowing that I have, because my preference always be to get it into individuals' hands, right? Mm-hmm. Like I know they want it, they're willing to pay for it, and I'm going to get it to them. Um, it's been very good versus once you send it out to distribution, it just sits on the shelf until someone buys it. I'd much rather know it's going to someone who values it and they're going to drink it immediately. So mm-hmm. placing orders when beers come out, and we've moved to a pre-order perspective, which we've always done with our distributors, but um, – doing that with the general public as well has been great because I know exactly how many I have sold, you know, and I can shave off beer going out for distribution so I can sell it locally or wherever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, uh, along those lines, uh, some people have noticed and commented that uh, some of your beers say brewed and canned in Orlando, Florida. So tell us a little bit about that for people that aren't familiar with what's going on there. Sure. So, um, we're based in Percival, Virginia, mm-hmm. and we brew beer in Percival, Virginia. And you can always know if we brewed it, what we call in-house, meaning at our own facility, because it'll say on the label, Percival, Virginia. Mm-hmm. But then anything else that's contract brewed, which we've always done, we've contract brewed from day one. Um, and to be frank with you, even though we're in the process of expanding our in-house brewing, um, we'll always, I think, contract brew just because our facility isn't big enough to sustain ourselves. Um, but you have to put where physically it was brewed. So you'll notice on a lot of our cans, they'll say Vent Hill, Virginia, which is a brewery here, you know, locally that we brew at. Um, but we started brewing at a place down in Florida. Um, Mm -hmm. from a contract perspective, we've released three beers so far that have come out of that facility, you know, so far so good. We kind of envision moving forward and then we're in the process of getting a third place online. Uh, to start brewing again, all of our beers are sold out and like grossly oversold. So we do need to increase our capacity. And even if the tanks that we have, um, uh, you know, spec for our expansion were online and operating right this second, mm-hmm. we'd still be oversold. There's just no scenario where we could, you know, brew enough beer to sustain, you know, what we need to do. Mm-hmm. And given that things are increasing versus staying stagnant or heaven forbid decreasing, you know, we're looking at other places that have more capacity than we do. And obviously there's some challenges in doing that, but like I said, we've been doing it for a long time that way. So we're familiar with, you know, some of the pitfalls and things you have to do to make sure that quality is high and, you know, that they're doing 
what needs to be done. Right. And then that leads well into, you know, asking me, have, tell a little bit more for people that don't understand contract brewing, why they shouldn't be worried about getting a beer from one of those sites as opposed to directly in house. Yeah. So, um, obviously there's a lot of breweries that, um, that do contract brew currently, um, or they'll do what they, they used to call gypsy brewing. Um, but basically the concept is that, you know, there's, there are breweries that have excess capacity, um, you know, empty tanks that they're not utilizing or they're not turning, um, efficiently. So basically we just rent space at these breweries. Um, that's, I think the easiest way of thinking about it. And we brew at their facility and use their equipment and then they'll package it on our behalf and we sell it under our own brand. Um, so, you know, obviously there's some potential, you know, quality concerns. Um, so there's things we have to do to make sure that, you know, the batches are up to our standards. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's pretty common, commonplace. Um, I mean, me Keller, evil twin, um, still water. I mean, those are famous breweries that have good reputations and high quality output. And up until very recently, all of them, that's hundred percent of their beer was done, you know, contract all over the world. Omnipolo, another great example. Again, great brewery, great reputation, hundred percent contract brewed. We don't do hundred percent. And to be frank with you, you know, we don't have the debt load and, and all of this infrastructure that some of these other places do. And mm -hmm. when there's an economic downturn, like we're currently in, we are very glad that we don't have you know, millions of dollars of debt and all this equipment and, you know, heaven forbid sales go down and you still got to make those payments. Yeah. We're much more, um, uh, I think limber in terms of our debt and, and, and operating expenses. I think they're much, much less than other breweries of our size. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. Like I said, you know, people in our audience that aren't as familiar with it, I think it's good for them to understand, you know, not only that process, but how many places actually do it. And they just really weren't aware of it until something like this kind of had them catch their eye. Um, I had all three versions of the illusion of safety that were brewed down there and I'd had them before and, you know, they were just as good as they were when they came out of house. So it wasn't a concern for me. <laughs> I actually think, I actually think, the the base goes was actually a little bit better um than than some of the earlier iterations mm -hmm. um coming out of the place in florida and that i think is because the, the new place we're brewing at has um a reverse osmosis uh treatment for their water mm -hmm. so they can strip out stuff that the other place that we're brewing at can't do stuff that's just inherent in their water that we just have to work around Mm -hmm. um, but we we started with a clean slate and we made the water exactly the way we wanted to. And I think that's the biggest variable because the recipe is the recipe, right? And the batch mm -hmm. process is the batch process. But at the end of the day, water is, it's the main driver, right? right. It's the water. Um, Absolutely. And being able to manipulate, manipulate that water the way you want it um, definitely translates into the final product. So, yeah. um, so we're very excited actually because um, the third place that we're, we're going to be hopefully bring at, imminently um, has even more sophisticated equipment than, you know, either of the places we're currently at. And, you know, um, we're a small brewery and like in Virginia, I mean, there's very few breweries that have, excuse me, the level of equipment that some of these other places that we're going to start brewing at do in terms of reducing dissolved oxygen, in terms of making the product that much more shelf stable because they have, you know, better filtration equipment, you know, better centrifuging equipment. So they have yeast springs they have in-house labs so we can do better analysis of our beers um you know yeast uh, propagation and health all these things are just going to make our product that much better i think than right now i think it's good but i mean like it can always be better it can always be more stable it can always you know have a better shelf life etc cetera, etc cetera. right yeah and especially the last part when you're talking about shelf life now shipping all over the world and how long that takes and as you mentioned earlier, how bogged down everybody is, and that might slow the process down even more. It's great to know that you're putting things in place where you're like, hey, if it takes, you know, three, four days, a week longer than we normally want it to, uh, we're pretty confident our beer is stable and it's going to be just as good when it arrives. That's great. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's a real deal. Holyfield, a lot of a lot of places we ship to, they're over, you know, they're air freighting it in. So, like, we're selling in Korea, mm -hmm. Japan, and they air freighted that stuff in. It's there seven days it's on the shelf seven days after we canned it right wow. so that's crazy you can, you can be in tokyo 
<laughs> and have a beer faster than you could buy it at your local total wine. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. Um, but then on the flip side, like we shipped the beer to France and, and it was refrigerated, thank God. But, um, it sat on a boat for two months because there were problems in the port and, you know, can't get mm. through customs and blah, blah, blah. And they're, you know, these French people, God bless them. You know, they're, 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 they're drinking beer today that we released in like, like January. And you're just like, oof. um, oh, you know still good but it's like it's not as good as it could be and should be so um i i I think this is a little bit more of like the middle term or maybe even to the long term but we're also contemplating actually brewing in whatever country we're going to be distributing in Hmm. so like if we have stuff going to europe we might go to europe and brew batches specifically for that market in europe and that way it can be there in seven days or whatever without the freight um, Mm -hmm. which obviously makes it more expensive so really trying to become, you know, an international brand in the same way that like Omnipolo and some, you know, Evil Twin and stuff have done in terms of their distribution model. Because um, uh, it's been very clear just in the last year of, of selling our products internationally that there's definitely demand for what we're doing. The landscapers are here. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's put it this way. There's 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 metal heads and and people that are into our our brand and our work all over the world. So, yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> a like good thing. Hey, so uh, tell us what you've got uh, coming up. Well, um, we haven't switched 100 percent to cans yet. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure it's inevitable, but a lot more beer that we would never put into cans, we're putting into cans. So like we have a barley wine coming out in a can. Uh, at the end of the month, we have a new Russian Imperial Stout, which, as you know, uh, is definitely you know our, in our wheelhouse of like the type of beers we love making. Um, we did an adjuncted version of, of one of our Red, Russian Imperial Stouts in cans, and I mean, it, I think it sold out in about two minutes. Um, we're also doing the Gozas, um, the, the heavily fruited sours in um, cans, um, and they've been well well received i think would be the word so that and you know uh, the idea factory and and the you know constant flow of new beers has not changed uh, i think in may we're dropping nine new beers and in june it's maybe like 10 or 12 you know what i mean so it just never ends it's just always new 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 um so that's been exciting that's great well mark i want to thank you for your time uh I hope that you and everyone at Adroit stay healthy and busy, as it sounds like you've been very busy. Uh, I look forward to a time in the near future when you and I can share a pint again in person. Well, let's hope our uh, our governor has at least, I think, like, moved some steps in the right direction. And we'll hopefully, hopefully, get your fingers crossed, uh, be able to at least provisionally open, you know, maybe sometime later this month. Uh, whether that stays in effect or, you know, goes backwards, we'll see. But... Um, I think, you know, I'm optimistic that the taste room can kind of get, quote unquote, back to normal, you know, at some point sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Um, And then hopefully just uh, everybody stays healthy. Sounds good. Well, you guys definitely do that. Stay healthy and stay busy on your end. And again, thanks for taking time to update us and we'll help get the word out so that we can keep even more busy than you are. (laughs) I appreciate it. I appreciate the uh, support. Thank you so much. Now more than ever, it's important for you to drink and support local. Buy beer, merchandise, gift cards, even just tips that can be given to workers to help get them through. If we all do our small part, we can get through this, and our favorite breweries will be waiting for us on the other side, where we'll be able to share a pint in person. Until then, thanks for watching. Share a pint is released bi-weekly on Friday mornings and can be found at sharepintpodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at share underscore pint. Show notes for this episode are available at sharepintpodcast.com. Music for the show, Groundwork, provided by Kevin McLeod and can be found online at incompetech.com. Share a Pint is made possible by help from the Community Media Center of Carroll County. Associated with the craft beer industry and have an interesting story you'd like to share on a future episode? Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at sharepintpodcast.com 
or email us at jerry at sharepintpodcast.com. Until the next time we share a pint, I'm Jerry Hollow. Prost.